name is Lori Hartwell, and I'm the president and founder of Renal Support Network. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's the fourth day of Hope Week. It's Friday. Uh, we've had so much fun, learned so much in the last couple of days, and we thank you for joining us for a fourth day. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to have um, a, a program about families and children with uh, kidney disease. So please help share the, the message if you know anybody who may benefit from attending that meeting. Um, a couple things before we get started, because we have a great speaker coming up. We have a great speakers all day. And uh, we have a, a virtual exhibit booth that we will be putting um, a, a link in the chat. And uh, we encourage you to go see all the exhibitors. And, and uh, there's also a little scavenger hunt for Monopoly pieces. And you can um, do a little survey and we'll send you a prize when um, you're finished. Um, in addition, uh, for those of you who don't know me, who may be signing on, um, I founded RSN back in 1993. Uh, I was diagnosed with kidney disease um, in 1968, 53 years ago at age two. And uh, I've experienced all the emotions and struggles and 13 years of dialysis and on my fourth transplant and uh, the emotional turmoil that that comes along with being diagnosed with a serious illness. So um, I created RSN because I know one friend makes a difference and an illness is too demanding when you don't have hope. And, uh, you know, you have to have hope. Hope is so essential to getting up and doing all the stuff that we need to do. And, and then one friend makes a difference because you can find hope through hearing other people's stories which leads me to our next speaker. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Henriette at a, an event many, many years ago, and it was at a different type of event. And, and I have to tell you, I have seen her grow over the years. I've seen her uh, accomplish some things that I thought, you know, it's unbelievable. And she's courageous, she's smart, she's hysterical. Uh, you want to sit by her at lunch. I'm going to tell you that. And she's going to tell you her incredible journey of, of um, addiction, some of the different things that happen. And many of my friends have suffered from addiction, and it's an illness. Uh, alcoholism and addiction is an illness, just like kidney disease. So I hope um, you'll tune in, hear her story. And uh, Henrietta, I'm so happy that you're here today. Hi, Lori. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I kind of need to pull myself together. You always um, inspire me. It's, it's no secret between us that you are truly one of my few heroes, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Well, um, I am so honored to have you here, and I'm just going to let you tell your story because it's pretty dang powerful. You bet. You bet. Thank you, Lori. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Henrietta Ivanans McIntyre. Um, I want to say, and I'm an alcoholic. I feel like I'm at a meeting. I share very often about that. And um, I do want to tell you a little bit about my journey through sobriety today. I'm just going to change that so I'm not staring at myself all the time. There we go. Um, so I'm going to begin, begin by, you know, coattailing on what Lori said, that, that addiction, I use the terms addiction and alcoholism interchangeably. Um, because I do believe it's a disease and it's less about the substance and more about the way that we think and the way that we have a problem living once we self-diagnose as addicts and alcoholics. It is listed in the American Medical Association as a disease that has uh, meets both psychiatric and physical guidelines. But for me, what really changed my life, and I want to make this really clear off the top, is that this is not in any way, shape or form a promotion for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are many ways to get sober, and it is simply a way that I've chosen to get sober and through the 12 steps. And it has completely changed my life, but I would never advocate for that. It's something that people who are struggling to get sober need to find organically on their own. It's also why we self-diagnose, why I say, hi, I'm Henrietta, I'm an alcoholic, because nobody else can diagnose me. It has to come internally from within the attic, they have to want it. And so in, in the big, that said, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it does talk about how this is a trifold condition and, and that makes sense to me. And that's how I can stay sober. 
there is a physical component to it, which is that we have an allergy almost like to drugs or alcohol or gambling or sex or overeating. I simply cannot stop. I have now lost the power of choice as an addict. Once I have a pill or a drink, I am simply unable now to overcome that craving and I will take and take and take and and crave and want more and more and more. And now since I've lost the power of choice, I will do that until until the gates of insanity or death, truly. Uh, The second part is I have a mental obsession. I obsess about everything. It is um, the mindset of the alcoholic truly where the problem lies, where we have to shift the way that we think so that we can live life differently. And what combines those three is the um, spiritual malady, the spiritual deficiency, if you will. You know, my mindset when I wake up in the morning as an active alcoholic, it's almost like it's a talk radio station in my head. It's 24 seven all Henrietta all the time. And I have to, I have to use these tools to change the frequency so that I know how to be less of a selfish and self-centered person. And so that I am open to the idea of something other than myself governing my life. Um, but there's no test, don't worry. <laughs> you know, I just want to give you a breakdown of what I believe this condition to be and how it works for me when I treat it every day. And Lori's very correct. I treat it every day the way that I treat my, my kidney disease with a few simple tools. So I will go back now. Um, I am, when I was uh, 10, my father died from alcoholism at 38 had a massive impact on my small family, my mother and my brother. When I was 13, I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, glomerular nephritis. It was a type of three different types of scarring. Nobody ever determined what the the virus was. And when I had my first transplant at age 19, uh, my mother was the the person that donated a kidney to me and she's here on the Zoom. So let's all just send a a shout out to my fabulous mother. She, when I, when, I was, when I had the first transplant in Toronto, Canada, where I was born and raised, uh, the discharge nurse said to me, if you are still in pain, you can go to a pharmacy and you can get Tylenol 1 with codeine. And that changed my life because I do remember the first time after the transplant, maybe a couple of weeks, that I took a Tylenol 3 with codeine. And I remember ingesting it and I wasn't in as much pain anymore. And so it had this effect on me and it wasn't about necessarily feeling good or high, but it gave me that sense of empowerment. It just gave me that feeling of being utterly comfortable in my skin. And I could, I could do the things that I needed to do with ease and comfort. You know, the, the default state of the alcoholic is very much one of just not being comfortable, not knowing how to live life always wanting more of something or feeling like I'm not a part of or, or missing out on something. And that, that, that coding gave me that feeling of I'm okay. I can breathe. Essentially that's what it boiled down to. I know how to do life. Um, and I continue to do that every day from age 19 or 20 until 42 when I was in Los Angeles and I went into rehab. That was something I did every single day. And I didn't know it at the time, but it was a craving, a physiological craving that was just triggered within myself. And so I'm going to pop ahead a little bit. I got married at 26 to my husband. We've been together for 30 years, been married for 26. We moved to Los Angeles and at age 40, my first kidney transplant went into rejection and it was, um, completely unhinged me. I'm not, I'm, I'm simply not uh, like a Lori, like Fanon. she's just, you know, wired a certain way and is a giver and is uh, ferocious in that. And I, in, at that period of time in my life, I, my active alcoholism was triggered and I simply didn't know how to deal with that. My addiction escalated, my pill use escalated. I began lying it, uh, I began manipulating doctors for more pills so that I could feel at ease in the situation so that I didn't have to feel that constant state of fear is everything. What I've learned the most, the most important thing that I've learned is, is that everything comes from a fundamental place of either fear or having some kind of faith. And where am I on that spectrum today? And I was in utter fear. I had no tools for this. And I was angry. I felt 
completely alone. And I always love how Lori talks about hope because I didn't have hope. Even though I had a husband who was unconditionally loving and supportive and a caregiver, I was so angry. I was so punishing. I was emotionally pummeling people and pushing them away. And the only thing that gave me relief were the drugs and the alcohol. And it escalated and escalated and escalated to a point where um, I overdosed. I, um, about a month after, no, two, four months after we had the transplant, Kevin ended up being a match to give me a kidney. Um, I think this is a good example of the mindset of the alcoholic. I, um, the first thing that I did after I was discharged, after having the second kidney transplant, was I cracked open a Corona and chugged my Percocet and my Dilaudid with it. And I had no qualms about that. To me, it was a celebration, like, oh my God, this is over with, thank God. It uh, sounds horrifying, but it was, again, it was something now that had been uh, triggered in me that I could not overcome. And another example of that is a couple of months before I went into rehab, I, um, I just, the state of our marriage had become basically roommates. You know, drugs and alcohol had become like my higher power, essentially what it was. It was, it was like my God. And, and the, the brain of the alcoholic simply gets hijacked. You know, this is not to excuse our behavior, but it's definitely an explanation that makes sense to me because nothing came above and beyond getting drugs and alcohol. And one night I simply had to keep drinking and I had no more vodka and we were living up in the hills. And I knew if I tried to drive, I would wake up my husband. I didn't even think that, oh, I can't drive because I've been drinking. Um, no, it wasn't about that at all. And then I had this genius thought. I thought, well, it's clear, it's alcohol. It's just a higher proof. I'll mix a cocktail with rubbing alcohol. And to me, I usually share that story when I share in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, because to me, that clearly demonstrates the complete insanity of this condition, because in that moment, it made complete and utter sense to me to drink that drink and to continue drinking, even though I was completely passed out, even though I had just had a kidney transplant, even though you don't consume rubbing alcohol, it says very clearly on the label that you don't, but that is what happens to the mind of the alcoholic. You have lost the power of choice. So, I want to skip ahead now to when I, I did go into rehab, I overdosed again on over 130 pills. I Once that was triggered, I could not stop. And I ended up in a rehab in West Hollywood. And that's really where everything um, began to change for me. It was, uh, I, I found my peeps, you know, Lori talked about finding one other person, but I found the people. Once I started going to those meetings, I I heard people share in a way that made sense to me. They were doing the things that I did. They were thinking the things that I thought, and I felt like I could breathe. I felt like I could breathe in the same way that I felt like I could breathe and be comfortable in my skin with a drug or a drink. And it was a very, very powerful experience. It took me, um, it took me a while. It took me a couple of years to become completely willing a hundred percent willing to give this up and to try a different way of life because it is a, it is a program of work. The 12 steps are work. It's a soul excavation, uh, soul digging. You've got to get down to your causes and conditions of why you acted the way you acted. We, we do inventory work. We look at our resentments and why we're angry at other people. Um, I am then accountable. When I've looked at that behavior with another alcoholic, I look, I'm accountable and I make amends and I go forward into to, uh, the relationships in my life where I've caused damage. And I try to heal those relationships by trying to stay sober and continuing to show up differently for those people. And then I try to be of service. I try to help other alcoholics. I try to um, be of service in my community. In, in whatever ways that, that is, whether it's something as simple as returning a shopping cart to where the shopping carts go. So a lot of people have, you know, I had an attitude about that. I was like, oh, somebody will do that. So that's somebody's job. 
And when I act that way, when I act differently like that, it, it changes my mindset. So I'm not consumed with myself. I do want to share um, what I, a couple of things that happened to me um, once I got sober and I had a couple of years of sobriety. So I'm eight years sober. I don't know if I said that, but I'm, I'm over eight years sober now. July 19th, 2013 is my date. And a couple of years into my sobriety, it ended up being the most powerful experience of my life, but it was horrendous. I developed a uh, very painful nerve condition. It had started out as a skin condition and uh, it morphed. It was started out as a rash and it morphed into this kind of nerve pain. And it, it literally brought me to my knees. It was like thorns coming up through my skin. It was like a constant, it's the way I've heard people describe shingles, like a constant electrical current through my body. I had uh, red flares all the time and it was difficult to sleep. It was difficult to wear clothes. It was challenging for me to do anything. And I, I knew I wasn't going to last sober. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get through this without some kind of pain relief. And I, but I knew that if I got any drugs or tried medical marijuana or did anything like that, I, I've conceded. I have fully admitted to myself, I don't have that in me. There's no going back. There's no unpickling someone that's drunk, rubbing alcohol. I, I get that. I have to remind myself every day, but I get that. And so what I chose to do that night, my husband wasn't home. It was two or three in the morning and I was in so much pain. And I thought, okay, step 11 is about prayer and meditation and trying to improve whatever contact we have with a higher power. And the thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, what I love about it is that your higher power can be whatever you want. We use the word God. You don't have to call it God. It just can't be you. And so I prayed, I prayed and I felt goofy and I felt dumb and I'd never really prayed in my life. And I sincerely begged to be truthful, to just have him or her or it or whatever it was, help me sleep. And something shifted in that moment. I'm not going to say it was like a big, you know, testify and everything changed and the pain went away because that was not what happened at all, but something shifted and I was able to get to sleep that night. And I became over time really sold on this, really, really sold on this action, this being willing to turn over whatever I was, whatever I was struggling with to something other than myself. And I started to develop a relationship. And the thing that was so powerful and amazing about that experience is in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's, it, it can be whatever you want, which meant I could talk to him however I wanted. I could give him the middle finger. I could swear. I could scream. I could tell him it wasn't fair. All of these things. And no no matter what I did, I began to feel closer to something else. It's a very challenging thing to describe, but I believe it is absolutely essential when you're dealing with chronic illness. And so now I have three, <laughs> I guess, with the nerve pain, addiction, and kidney, kidney disease. Um, for me, it is essential to have some kind of a higher power and building some kind of spiritual life. Just keeping an eye on the time here. Um, I call him Big G and that's just because he's my pal and I enjoy spending time with him. And that's what it's become. I, I crave this kind of a life where I do things like pray and I meditate um, and I work with others, other alcoholics. Um, I show up at meetings and I contribute. I crave that now in the way that I craved uh, a drug or a drink to give me that relief. You know, <laughs> life is life really throws you some wrenches. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing what, what Lori has sustained physically. And, and I know a lot of you out there as well who are dealing with kidney disease, you're on dialysis or transplantation. And so I wanna share a few of the things that keep me sober because ultimately this is not, addiction is not, drugs and alcohol are not a thing that we can depend on. So, um, what I ended up doing in rehab, which I would like to share with you, is I had found writing, which is funny because I had gone 40 years really without doing much writing at all. And I began writing a blog when I was in rehab. And it was a um, kind of just a dumping, just a dumping of my soul. And it, it wasn't like a hit blog or anything like that. I think a few of my friends were following it at night. 
but there was something in that uh, creative excavation that that filled me up that just gave me peace and Lori is also huge huge on find you know find something creatively that will nourish your soul it doesn't matter what it is like find the thing that will the thing that you you want to do all the time the thing that you lose track of time while you're doing it the thing that you don't care if you get paid ever for doing it and that's what i found in in writing and i became known in actually in rehab for um I had to get my computer out of contraband between 5 and 7 p.m and and i had like you know two hours to write a little blog and eat some supper and and then i would shoot this thing off and i felt empowered the way that first pill had made me feel empowered i encourage you to find that thing um and i ended up during that period of time with the nerve pain i ended up writing a book which um it's totally up to these guys if they want to share the information but the whole journey through writing a book about um my marriage to my husband was um it's very difficult to explain but it was my husband my relationship with my husband took a long time to heal we do a lot of damage and it is like i said it is not an excuse that you're dealing with a disease but it is what you're dealing with and it was a long journey for us to understand that he had a role too and that he had to accept that it was a disease and that he had to decide whether or not he wanted to stick around there's no guarantee that i'm going to stay sober i i do do this thing one minute at a time some days and uh writing a book to have a goal to have a purpose like that to uncover a talent that i didn't realize i had was also very empowering but to try and do it during the years of nerve pain without any relief you know some days i know a lot of you must also struggle with this some days it is nearly impossible to think about getting through an entire day when you're dealing with chronic pain or constant appointments or a, a, a system that is not necessarily um a preventative system a challenging insurance system like these are all things that weigh down on us as we're trying to um trying to heal ourselves and trying to become strong and so um that was for me writing a book was was like an anchor for me in the way that alcoholics anonymous became an anchor i have found communities as a result of getting sober not only with the people in alcoholics anonymous but with people like lori there's other people in um renal support network shyan ali these younger women who are in their 20s and they've had two transplants They're extraordinarily inspirational to me. We have to find what I call our peeps. I have found my peeps. These are people that understand the way that I think. They understand my experiences. And life is simply too overwhelming if you don't find those communities. And then additionally, I also found a community um through through my writing, a storytelling salon that I was a part of in Los Angeles. And so and and then I also encourage you to I remember and I'll 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 start wrapping up. I guess I have a few minutes. Um you know, I remember when I was 19 years old and I had my first transplant. It was very different back then in 1988. I'm sure Lori can testify to this. Um you know, I was on a lot more immunosuppression. My face was radically altered and as a young girl, really, not even a woman at that time, um I felt just profoundly alone there was not social media at the time there was not the the incredible technological access that we have today and i'm i wish so badly i had that because i felt so alone at that time and so that is also something that i do is I encourage you to to get on some kind of social media and and hashtag and find groups and and reach other people that are sharing and and living through the same experiences that you are um Let me see what else I can I can share. I think I might have wrapped it up too soon, Lori. <laughs> But I, you you're, know, you're I, awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I I I my life is completely different today, but I will say addiction is and alcoholism is real and it still pops up for me in my behaviors. You know, I I'm not cured. This is not a condition where we're cured. And I think uh, this is a a challenging thing for the medical community to understand that's been my experience that i've had doctors and i've i've run into physicians who don't quite get that i'm not 
finished. And it really is a, a lifetime of work because the mindset of the alcoholic is still a default of being selfish and self-centered. And I have to work every day. Like I said earlier, I, I choose, I have a choice today. I choose every day to show up differently, to, to put others first, to continue to look at my behavior, um, to do things I don't want to do for other people and to grow as a result of that. And it's, um, it's a fantastic and amazing life. It's a challenging life. But if anybody wants to reach out to me, I am absolutely happy to email you. Um, I don't know if Lori can provide that information. And um, I think that's all I'm going to say for today, Lori. I'm, I'm so grateful to you. I'm, I'm so grateful for my life. And anyway, thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. Henrietta, you're awesome. There's a lot of virtual applause going on right now. I can see it. And um, please, yeah, email us if you'd like to get in contact with Henrietta. Henriette. No, <laughs> no, it's Henrietta. Henrietta, right. and she yep. will, um, I know the E just throws me off. I'm sorry. No, it's <laughs> and, all good. And, and it's uh, she's also on Facebook. So uh, if you're on Facebook, she loves to be um, for people to follow her there. And her book, Impillness and Health, I just heard you got, it, it's going to be translated in Spanish now. You got to yeah. learn Spanish now, Henry. I know. I'm not going to be able to see if it's a good translation. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's awesome. I have one question for you before we uh, go to our next session. Uh, but yeah, about alcoholism. Um, how did you find AA? Um, it was through, I, I ended up in rehab. I went to rehab and they brought meetings to us. And then we also, um, we went to meetings. It was an option. It was not forced upon us. It, they, they're not legally allowed to do that. But once I started going, I absolutely, um, I, I absolutely connected with the communities and what they were saying so, so completely and so instantly that I loved going to me. I still love going to meetings. It's very powerful. It's very easy to find meetings, especially in Los Angeles or, or anywhere in the States. You just have to basically Google AA meetings in whatever your city is. Well, and I think, um, you know, I actually have a little disclaimer. My mom was an alcoholic and I went to AA and Al-Anon and Alateen when I was a kid. And a lot of the principles of AA and Al-Anon um, I provide in RSN. So one friend makes a difference, everyone. And if you're struggling with addiction, um, please seek help. If you're a family member who has a loved one who has addiction, please you know, check out Al-Anon. It really is a wonderful program. Thank you, Henrietta. I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you for having me, Lori. I love you. You're just a hero. <laughs> I love mom. you too. Um, pee all you can pee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are the reason I pee. That's what I say to my husband. Exactly. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. Well, Thanks. our next, uh, uh, that was amazing, everybody. When you hear her full story, it just brings you to tears because she is so brave, so courageous to share her story. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.